This is Cinephile 111, Child Abuse, Change of Sex. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, uh, I know this is the Health Committee, Mr. Chairman, but I'm bringing you a criminal code bill. And it's something that you have to be convinced that the action we're talking about here is criminal and not health care. Um, what, what the bill does is it makes changing the sex of a child and defense defines child as anybody under the age of 18, standard definition. Uh, it makes changing the sex of a child, child abuse, which is a felony. Um, let me explain the need that I see that, that caused me to, to bring the bill. Um, there is very commonly, Mr. Chairman, uh, when an individual hits puberty, uh, there's often some confusion of, about issues relating to sexual and gender identity, that sort of thing. Most people that straightens out pretty rapidly as just normal part of the growing up process, I think, Mr. Chairman. But it does affect a number of individuals a good deal more severely. And there is a fad, and I, I will call it just plain that because I think that's what it is, among some of the adolescents of trying to solve the confusion and uncertainty by changing their sex. Um, again, most of them, I think, grow out of it uh, and are content with, with who they are. But what's happening is that people are preying on young uh, adolescents that, that are having that kind of confusion and persuading them that the way to solve it is to get their sex changed to the other, other sex. And that has terrible consequences. Yet, when you do that, my understanding is the first thing that you're giving up is the ability to ever have your own child, ever. That, that you lose that forever. Uh, you, there's often, uh, if they really change sex, they're often basically mutilating surgery that's done. Uh, it, and it, you never successfully change it all the way because you still got the chromosomal structure that you were born with. That's not changeable. And that has effects. Uh, so what, and these younger children that are involved in this simply do not have, they haven't been alive long enough. They haven't got the experience with life to understand the real implications of what they're doing they j and they just don't have the maturity uh they don't know what it's all about yet and say most most of them outgrow it but you're doing something they, if they get a sex change that's basically irreversible and i don't see any any way that they can give informed consent to to, to this because they just don't understand um uh, so what the bill does is if you look at the bottom of page one, uh, it adds a new subsection D to the child abuse statutes. And what I did was copy the language from the uh, subsections that are just above it that are not shown in this bill. Uh, so that, and put into it the uh, appropriate requirements uh, for this crime. A person is guilty of child abuse, a felony punishment by imprisonment for not more than 10 years. That language is, is just copied right out of the pieces above. If a person intentionally inflicts upon a child under the age of 18, any procedure, uh, drug, other agent or combination thereof that 
is administered to intentionally or knowingly change the sex of a child. So you've got all those elements there. And then we added one sentence that wouldn't be appropriate uh, elsewhere. Uh, consent of the child, the child's parents, guardian, etc., cetera, uh, is not a defense to the crime of, defined by this subsection. That's making it very clear. In, in healthcare, you could do things with the consent of the parent. This is criminal. That doesn't, doesn't suffice. Then there is a set of exemptions uh, following not constitute child abuse. I'll go through them br very briefly. Uh, you, get, you get medical treatment where you, you have very rare instance, but it does happen where you get somebody born with ambiguous uh, sexual identity. And my understanding of the common medical practice is that the doctors and the parents get together and say, okay, you need one, you got both, you need one or the other and, and deal with it. Uh, and that's limited, you have to diagnose it early. Um, second, medical treatment associated aftercare of child born with the external genitalia of female and the chromosomal structure of a male. This is where you have the XY chromosome structure and the female body plan, which is in human development, turns out to be the default body plan. And that's often discovered later in life. It's, again, very rare, uh, but it's, it's been publicized and there have been some, some cases quite notorious. They often find it when they get to testing athletes uh, or sometimes why, why is the girl not uh, able to get pregnant, uh, not having periods, that sort of thing. Uh, and they do a chromosomal test. And, oh, uh, so that's, that's often that's discovered later than, than this bill would cover when they're adults. But if it does get discovered in, in somebody who's still a child, you got to be able to deal with that. So that's an exception. Again, very rare. The lawyers had me put in going the other way. And I think that is so perishingly rare that basically it doesn't occur in nature. Um, the uh, item three, treatment of a child develops whole or in part characteristics of the other sex and the treatment's designed to just ameliorate that, deal with that. And that'll happen. Uh, boys will sometimes develop female breasts often as a byproduct of another serious disease or the treatment for that other serious disease. You got to deal, you got to treat that and you're, you're not trying to change their sex. You probably don't need that. And that's in there just in case the doctors are afraid uh, to treat that properly, uh, given this one. I don't. Uh, so that's that one. And then finally, medical treatment associated aftercare necessary. We got a traumatic injury uh, or life threatening physical disease. Uh, not including psychological or emotional. Uh, the physical diseases, it's clear you need to do something, I think. Some of the mental ones, you get spectrum disorders, and that, if you allowed this kind of sex change to result of those, you'd create a loophole that would be just impossible, Mr. Chairman. What I've tried to do, Mr. Chairman, in this bill is to keep it as simple as possible. You know, you can get into a lot of details, get lost in the weeds of medical treatment. So I tried to make it simple. The standard is, did they intentionally change the sex of the child? If they did, it's a crime. If they didn't, it's not a crime. I think that will take care of 80, 90% of the problem. It will uh, enable other adults that are, that are dealing with the confusion that you get in puberty here to understand that the, you have to help the child through this, let them grow up uh, and not try to change their sex to solve, solve the temporary distress that they might deal with. Um, 
we may have to come back if somebody gets creative and finds a way to get around this and put a stop to that. But I think this will solve most of the problems. And that's about as much as we can hope for in legislation, Mr. Chairman. You never get it quite perfect. Uh, but this establishes the principle, and I would urge the committee to assist me in keeping it simple. Um, Mr. Chairman, that's that's the bill. Uh, I've seen personally cases where there have been abuses in this area, where counselors tried to persuade uh, an adolescent to do a sex change. Uh, in case I happen to be familiar with, wasn't in this state, and the parents managed to uh, talk the child out of it. Uh, but I think there's risks here in this state. It's happening all over, and, and I don't think we're immune to the national feud, and I have anecdotally heard of problems in this state. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chairman, stand for questions. And Thank you, Senator Scott. Questions, committee? Senator Oxtetter. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Scott. Uh, noticing some other states uh, addressing similar legislation, but uh, you're probably correct in your summary. They seem more more complicated or a little more detailed. You kept it basic because you want to focus again, if you'd repeat that, focus on what? Focus on setting the principle that this is child abuse. I think if we focus on that, we get most of the job done. I think the other states are trying to, I looked at some of those, they're too complicated. You get into the weeds of medical treatment. You get into the weeds, you forbid something that is also used for something else. I think we're much better off trying to keep it focused on if you actually change the sex of the child, that's child abuse. Further questions? Seeing none from the committee. Thank you, Senator Scott. Have a seat nearby. If you remember testimony yesterday, we have four seats up here. I'd like two pro, two con, or not con, uh, up, opposed. So if you would, we'll do the, the per, supporters on this side, opposition on this side. So please, Rue. First of all, is there anybody from any agency here? Uh, I thought we had somebody earlier, but they're gone. So let's go ahead and start beginning through the room. I need two, two supporters over here in these two chairs, two opposition over here, and we'll work our way through. As soon as your testimony is done, go ahead and go back to your seat and, and let somebody else occupy the now warm seat. Go ahead, ma'am. Welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hello, members of the committee. As you may remember, I am Mara McManaman from Goshen County in Torrington, Wyoming. I am in support of this bill 100%. Please vote aye on this bill. Thank you for your time and I'll stand for any questions. You get the second shortest testimony today. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being back with us. Mr. Winnie, go ahead, sir. Any questions, committee? No, go ahead, sir. Mr. Chairman, Bill Winnie, Sublight County. <clears throat> Along the way of uh, my 30 years active duty in the Navy, I served as commanding officer uh, twice, total of about five years. I was leading people that were a number of people that were in the what is probably the higher age bracket of what's contemplated in this bill 18 19 20 years old but i think the things i observed and learned uh <clears throat> would serve discussing it in, with the bill by the way i support the bill um on one ship I was on, I saw a young man pulled into a system. The military has a system for treating alcoholics. And I saw one young man pulled into that system that was labeled a dry alcoholic. And I thought that odd. He didn't have a problem. He worked fine, everything. Let the young man go into the system and, you know, the system did what it did. He came out. At the end of the process, as I looked at this young man, I concluded he had been drawn into a system that had projected onto him some of their own attitudes or whatever. And so I can, I've concluded in looking at young people, what do they need? They need to see adults that they can model after, but they don't need adults pushing things onto them. And I think that's a gist of what this bill is trying to get at, is don't push things onto kids. 
They're receptive sometimes when they shouldn't be. Uh, you might recall some several decades ago, uh, certain parts of this nation went through a, uh, uh, what should I call it? Anyway, child abuse and demonic thing going on in uh, child care facilities and things went on and, and people were prosecuted. And after that ran its course, the legal system finally concluded, you know, that probably wasn't what we should be doing. So the issue of projecting onto young people is very important. And I think that is exactly what uh, Senator Scott's bill gets at. So subject to your questions, thank you. Questions committee? Sensing none, thank you very much. If you two would go ahead and trade your seats somewhere. Go ahead, sir. Hi, uh, thank you for your time. I'm Bob Prentice, a retired pediatrician, uh, 50 years in pediatrics, 44 here in Cheyenne. I got a gravelly voice, I apologize for my cold. Uh, I strongly object to the criminalization of treatment of the children and as a pediatrician thinking that I might be the one that goes to jail for 10 years for doing something that I think is within the realm of medical care and appropriate uh, frightens the heck out of me. And maybe that's probably what Dr. I mean, uh, Mr. Scott's uh, plan is, but I, I just don't think it's right. I think it should be left alone. It's a medical thing, something between the children and their families and their doctors. Um, the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, all have statements saying that criminalization of treatment is inappropriate and should be left out of the law books. I could say more, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Questions, committee? See none, thank you, doctor, coming in. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, chairman and senators. I'm Richard Lennox. I am a retired teacher and a small business owner here in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Um, I came to speak ag against this bill, primarily um, looking at the um, Romanet number three on page three, where um, Chairman Scott did mention a specific characteristic, but the bill does not mention physical characteristics. So my concern is where this harkens back to if a, a child is displaying, maybe a boy is displaying feminine characteristics or a girl is displaying masculine characteristics, because that's the word here in the bill that um, those parents are okay to seek medical um, input and intervention. And it kind of harkens back to that um, gay conversion therapy. I did send you guys an email about that. And I did mention that um, many states, if not half, have already outlawed that practice. Um, the most recent was Utah two years ago, um, outlawed and banned the gay conversion therapy. And this bill seems to be going in the opposite direction of what the trend is in the country to tell those parents, yes, seek medical treatment or mental treatment if you don't like how your child is acting. But if a parent wants to support their child and who they are, that we're going to criminalize. And, and that just seems really, it's, it's a bill, it's a Senate file that kind of has two separate kind of messages in it. Also, it seems to be that the, the both the House and the Senate this year are actually sending two different messages as well. There's a lot of parent, um, parent rights bills and files out there that are supporting parents, but this one actually goes a 180 and now we want to criminalize the parents in this topic. And it's certainly a topic that the conversation is important. We, we certainly need to talk about this. We certainly need to learn how to navigate through these new issues, both in the healthcare, um, with this body, but to jump to criminalizing it is, is really just a step too far. With that, I'll stand for questions. Questions, committee? Seeing none. Oh, here's one, Senator Bashar, go ahead, sir. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Lennox, uh, I just want to be clear that this bill doesn't have anything to do with homosexual tendencies. Uh, one of the studies that I personally looked at, up to 92% of the children that were just left alone, the rest actually be, had homosexual tendencies and went on to live a, a normal life. So that's what's going on here. So, I mean, do you understand that this bill is totally different than what you're talking I, I, about? I do, um, I, and I thank you for that question, Senator Bouchard. Um, Mr. Ahead. Chairman, I was just look. I was going off the language here, and, and I did hear um, Senator Scott mention something about um, breast and mammary, those characteristics that were physical, um, but this does not say that. So that's kind of where I was coming from looking at the language in on page three there, lines one through five. It just seemed like, you know, we're going to, it seems very obscure or kind of too broad where we're looking at more, the intent seems to be that was a physical characteristic, but it's not reading that way to me. Follow up, Quick follow-up, Mr. Chairman. To be fair, he was talking about if they had to make a change for something physical that happened that has nothing to do with a child is even going through this process. That's what I got from what, what um, Senator Scott was talking about. Thank you. Okay. Let's go. Oh, Senator Cox. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, sir. For a doctor. Uh, sir? Sir. Doctor. Thank you. Many years of service that you offered. Thank you for your help there along the way. Are you opposed? To anything specific or just the overall concept? Did, did you read the bill as far as the wording? I, I've read the bill and I understand uh, the reason that those exceptions are there and that's appropriate. Um, but I also think that um, in a time when we're concerned about mental and physical health of people, um, that we don't allow children and their families to make decisions in this area uh, just as they would about treatment for diabetes or cancer or, or whatever. This, this is not taken lightly. This isn't a journey anybody really wants to go on. And uh, they need all the support they can get. And over the years, um, I've had to treat kids or help treat kids or make treatment available um, for many, many medical conditions. And um, I would like to, I'm not sure how you would police this. I get worried that it would almost be, you know, turning your neighbors and your medical staff into tattletales. Um, nobody does this uh, kind of work for fun or for profit. Um, no surgery is done on any children under 18, at least in this area. I think some mistakes were made in the past, but I think everybody's aware of what needs to what needs to be done and, and done slowly and deliberately. So um, I don't agree that uh, well, I think in essence um, not allowing referral and treatment that specialists might recommend. Um, <clears throat> Is, is wrong, it's just wrong. It just doesn't recognize the mental health of, of the children and it is discriminatory. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Okay, we got two new folks up here that empties two chairs, two preferably in opposition. These two these two chairs are for supporters, those two chairs are for opposition. Go ahead, I, th I saw you arm wrestle, I believe, Representative Ogman won. Go ahead, Representative. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. Um, I would speak in favor of this bill uh, and am a, um, well, I'm a supporter of it. And the main reason is, is because it's to handle um, something specifically, and that's mutilation of a body of a child under 18 years of age to remove breasts, to remove uh, testicles to create different things in a, a young person's body at a time when they are developing physically and mentally and emotionally um, is, is just cruel and unusual. 
Uh, we go, all go through stages in our lives where we have confusion. Um, as was stated earlier, there's mental, mental health problems after um, this pandemic and things. And people are at a stage where they need to have the time to regroup and to think about what's going on. If there is um, reason to believe that this might be a way that you would like to go, there's testimony of people that uh, had the transition operations when they were adults. They could make that decision themselves. They didn't have to go through all of the physical growth, uh, numerous, numerous, numerous operations for years, uh, drugs, probably for the rest of their lives. And that's a lot on a child. And also, um, the bill covers that if there is evidence that this might be a physical thing uh, at birth, that up to the age of four, that can be done. So I would just um, say that I am for this bill. I thank you for your consideration. I'll stand for any questions. Questions for Representative Altman? Seeing none, thank you, Representative. Deacon Lehman, go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> members of the committee. My name is Mike Lehman, representing the Catholic Diocese of Cheyenne. And I just want to say um, to open, it's critically important to remember how difficult the process of maturation from childhood to adulthood is in, in any circumstance. And then add a compounding difficulty of what it feels like for a young person who experiences discordance with her, his or her own biological sex. Think too of the powerlessness we feel as parents, unable to soften the blows of life's lessons. We sit nearby and anxiously pray and hope that our children find a way to keep getting up again. And then someone mentions the words of suicidal ideation and you hit your knees. You're ready to listen to anyone who promises a tomorrow for your child. It's um, important to understand these experiences to understand why there may be some animosity for those of us who question the validity of the promises that, that are being made. The truth is every claim that suggests that gender affirming care is successful at mitigating suicidal ideation is qualified by the admittance that there are no long term studies currently to inform us on how this impacts children in the long term. Perhaps as a parent, one feels that if it keeps my child alive for one day, then it's worth doing, and that is certainly understandable. But real science isn't supposed to make assumptions or promises. It's supposed to help us uh, in, be informed, fully informed. And, and as Senator Scott mentioned, the brain development at that young age is not fully developed. And as parents, this, the, the, this particular situation is still very new to our society. And so being fully informed, that's a, a very high standard uh, for us to meet. We know that puberty blockers impact bone development. We know that cross-sex hormone treatments and surgeries can lead to infertility and sterility. Because sex chromosomes, pairs of X and Y are the cause of our expressed biological sex, ultimately these treatments do not succeed in actually changing sex. They merely succeed in changing appearance according to social gender stereotypes. Because these chromosomal indicators exist at the cellular level, affirming care, which seeks to change and prolong the stereotypical appearances of the opposite sex, requires lifelong medicalization of these children. The Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine recently published an article highlighting a challenge to the Dutch study that claimed gender-affirming treatment led to positive outcomes for children. And I quote the society's summary of this article. And the article was titled, The Myth of Reliable Research in Pediatric Gender Medicine. 15 seconds. Well, I will have to cut it down significantly, Mr. Chairman. Ultimately, it questions the, the validity of these, the research that was done in these Dutch studies that are often quoted. And, and Mr. Chairman, I just want to say, finally, Ultimately, as parents uh, of children, regardless of what they're experiencing, we have to remain in, in contact and communication is important that we do that. And, and with that, I, I will end because I know I'm at the end of my time. Thank you very much. Questions for Deacon? Say none. Thank you very much for coming. We'll work on your fast speech. Yeah. Okay.
Let's go on down. Somebody, if somebody wants to come up and occupy those two seats, this would be supporters. Go ahead, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Dr. Hollis Hackman, I'm a psychologist from Sheridan, Wyoming. I'm representing the Wyoming Psychological Association. I'll be brief here. We're opposed to this bill. Um, it, there is ambiguity in here about the role of mental health providers. Um, and Mr. Chairman, th this is not my area of expertise. I, we may have a provider who specializes in this area that has tried to zoom in this morning. I don't know if she was able to make it or not, but I would just point out that childhood uh, gender dysphoria is a um, diagnosable mental disorder, and we have providers um, that work in that area. They provide behavioral health interventions to uh, address issues and help head off um, complications that that can lead to bad outcomes, uh, mentally speaking. So, so just to briefly, we're, we're opposed to this bill as it presently stands, and I would stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Hackman. Senator Dockstader, your uh, place on. Uh, Dr. Hackman, your association, is that when they come to a decision like this, is it a, a full vote, unanimous vote, a majority vote? How do they decide to come out in opposition? Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Dockstetter, that's a that's a tough question. Uh, things happen rapidly at the legislative level with with bills that come forward. We do have a listserv, and when I'm made aware of um, a bill that might impact our profession, I throw it out on the listserv immediately so I can get input from from our um, colleagues and 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 providers that are part of our association and. All the comments that I've received on that list served in the last uh, 48 hours since I really got aware of this bill are, are all negative and are not in support of the bill. Thank you. Further questions for Mr. Ackman? No. Go ahead. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for your time this morning. My name is Amber Pollock. I'm from Casper, Wyoming. I come before you today to express my opposition to Senate File 111. I'll start by saying I don't think the members of the Wyoming legislature have a full understanding of trans issues. My apologies if I'm wrong and you have in fact had a close personal experience with a trans person navigating the world or have really taken the time to learn from experts in the related fields, but I would guess that's likely not the case. And I don't say this to call anyone out because the truth is most people don't have a full understanding of trans issues. They can be complex and difficult to, to relate to, and for many people, it won't be something they confront directly in their lives. And generally, I would say it's okay that most people don't fully understand it. You don't have to understand something to be kind and, and uh, respectful of folks. Um, but today, in this room, it's not okay to not fully understand it because you are in a position to make life-altering decisions for Wyoming families. You are positioned to make felons out of parents who are faced with making very difficult decisions in the best interests of their children. And if that's not a responsibility that requires a complete and accurate understanding before proceeding, I don't know what is. The road to a better understanding of this issue is laid out by many people in this room. Folks who have walked this path can provide accurate information about the experience. I would suggest that perhaps the best response to feeling like we don't understand something is to not assume that folks who are experiencing that thing must be doing something wrong or are somehow incapable of making good decisions on behalf of themselves and their family members. Instead, we can work to listen to the families who are being directly affected and let them be the experts on what the best way to deal with these issues is. I believe that these parents want what's best for their kids just as anyone else does and are in the best position to understand what that is. And if you can put yourself in their shoes for a time, I suspect that even though maybe you couldn't understand, you would want to be able to do whatever you needed to do to help your kid without interference from the legislature. I urge you to vote no on this bill to preserve parents' rights to work with professionals and do what's best for their kids. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pollock. Any questions for Ms. Pollock? Seeing none, there's three empty seats. Sir, you occupy the lone seat up there now. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, Chairman Baldwin and uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Steve Miller. I'm a resident of Cheyenne. I have a master's in public health and I've been in public health education, which includes sexuality, for the last 30 years. We are telling and we are confusing our kids, um, as Mr. Winnie had mentioned, they are being pushed into uh, a line of thinking. We are telling Johnny that his brain is in Susie's body and that we have to castrate him 
and growing breasts, et cetera, to make him into a girl. And they were telling Susie, well, your brain is in Johnny's body and we have to cut off your breasts and uh, remove your uterus to construct your penis for you and make you to a girl. Um, and to think that there are councils out there, as Mr. Winnie had mentioned and some others had mentioned that uh, uh, they are performing these surgeries and uh, pushing these types of uh, ideas onto the children that uh, the only thing to do that you can do is to change your sex. Uh, we have outlawed in some parts, uh, I believe here in Wyoming also a few years ago, female genital mutilation. Uh, how is this any different when we uh, take uh, body parts from uh, other people? Uh, the body is correct, actually, and it's a mind that needs to be modification to accept its, its actual reality. And if a child can decide uh, their sex, then when will we allow children to decide what species they are? There are people who generally believe that they are dogs and cats and wolves and elves and deers and aliens, et cetera. And I can send you information on this. I was researching it and they have spent thousands of dollars in multiple surgeries to alternate. They call it body modification, but it's also mutilation. It's also called BIIN, uh, body integrity identity disorder. It includes people who believe that parts of their body, which are perfectly good and working, are wrongly attached and they need to be removed. And that includes arms, legs, hands, eyes, and genitalia. Uh, Deacon Lehman had mentioned about the depression and suicide. Uh, these are not the results of people who support this bill, but those people who uh, push this information, such as uh, Mr. Winnie had mentioned earlier, uh, and it confuses children. Uh, gender affirming needs to be the affirming the person's biological uh, sex, their gender, there's male and their female and not surgically altering um, the body and whatnot. So there's many facets to this, but if you take perfectly good working body parts, breasts, penises, testicles, uterus, and say, nope, they're wrong, God made a mistake, well, I don't believe in God. Well, evolution made a mistake, well, I don't believe in evolution. Uh, nature made a mistake, whatever you believe in, how can you say that, uh, oh, the body is wrong, uh, somebody made a mistake, and we have to completely reconstruct the body to fit the mind as opposed to uh, change the mind to fit the body. So uh, I, I totally support this bill and I ask for your uh, yes vote on it. Questions committee? Seeing none, go ahead. Whoever, whoever won the arm wrestling. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Get this right, there you go. My name is Andrew Rose. I'm a pediatrician at the Cheyenne Children's Clinic. Um, I'm also representing the uh, State Academy of Pediatrics today. Uh, I'm the current president of the uh, Wyoming chapter. Um, and I come in opposition to this bill for many reasons, but I just wanna go through some notes I wrote. Um, for 10 years, I've been here in Cheyenne helping families and kids. And at times I've had to um, be there when kids have felt boxed in by their gender that was assigned at birth. These kids and these families, as uh, Dr. Prentice said earlier, they don't seek this out. They're not, they're not, uh, you know, they don't want to find themselves in that situation, especially, why would they, especially here in Wyoming? And no, these kids aren't just confused. They're not immature. They're not just in a state. Instead, they identify in a way that society tells them they shouldn't. And of course, that creates dissonance. Um, in respect to Senator Scott, who's never taken care of children, or probably really talk to teenagers that have been in the same situation or the families going through this directly. No, this is not a simple problem. This is not just X's and Y's and you're not looking, I mean, if you are looking for a cause, we're talking about differences in brain chemistry, not just a whim or a adolescent phase or fad as was mentioned. The dissonance, the dissonance that I talk about felt by these teenagers is problematic. It leads to a whole host of issues, including depression, anxiety, homelessness, and suicide when that's allowed to continue. And it's been proven um, and it really makes sense that if there's a society that refuses to affirm people where they're at, no matter what the issue is, those problems are going to get worse. And the alternative is true too, however, the sooner that we accept kids where they're at, the better those outcomes will be for them. So really, if we want to do something that actually is beneficial and protects children and teenagers, why don't we start, why doesn't Wyoming start by taking on the task of reducing suicide rate? 
because right now teenagers with gender dysphoria are arguably the most at risk group of, of kids at that age for suicide. Let's actually provide acceptance and the gender affirming care that they need. The care that's been proven to dis decrease risk of suicide set over and over. And we won't accomplish this by sending messages to physicians and to parents that they will be locked up for doing the right thing for children. And regardless, here in Wyoming, we're not doing surgeries. We're not, there's no one doing the ir irreversible therapies on ki kids here in Wyoming. The hormone therapies that are spoken about, given in our, that could be given in our state, probably prescribed out of state, those hormone therapies are meant to delay puberty. And true, there are problems, like the research isn't complete in terms of effects on bone and long-term. <coughs> 15 <coughs> seconds. The long-term effects, so those, the, but the things that are done currently would be reversible. Um, frankly, I, in good conscience, I just don't know how a group of supposed proponents of, of limited government and individual liberty who don't have expertise in the area want to take away parental rights and autonomy um, and make it a felony for physicians to practice here and to do the right thing for kids. And if that continues, I don't see myself and most of my colleagues wanting to practice in a state where that is true. Thank you. Question, Senator Doxter. Thank you, uh, doctor. Thank you for coming. Similar question to our state psychologist. This is a unanimous vote in your association. Go ahead, doctor. Sorry, my colleagues and I, we communicate primarily because we're so spread out via um, a kind of email and uh, internet network. And so we haven't had like a formal vote, but the um, we at our last meeting, we had discussed gender affirming care at our um, at our society meeting in October. And that's where the sort of more or less consensus has come from. Thank you, doctor. Further questions, Senator Bouchard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, something that uh, you said, Doctor, about being reversible. Um, I mean, I, I, one of the questions that I'm asking is how, how do you reverse a removal of mammary glands to the point where you've, they've scraped down, even taken away the, all the tissue that has the ducting? And the other thing is you mentioned something about depression and other other mental illnesses from the studies that i've seen which includes up to 92 percent uh, they did not treat just those depression and other ailments and went right to what they said was a, a, a transgender problem and but yet in those same studies if they just got them through the depression and the other other ailments they they would get through life and become actually even be comfortable in their bodies. Maybe some of them would have uh, homosexual tendencies. It was a very small percentage. Isn't that doing no harm? I mean, when we start taking a scalpel out and start doing procedures, we're doing something totally different. I don't, I'm just not sure it's it's reversible. And I just want to add one more thing. I've had to, I've done a deep dive into this. Mm. And I've seen some of the surgeries they're doing in some of these hospitals, in children's hospitals, mind you, although they haven't, some of them aren't children yet because they're, they're trying, it looks to me like they're trying to do it in people that are over 18 in children's hospitals as they move to make it acceptable. And they, they've done what they call, a, a, I mean, I don't know what the procedure is actually, what we would call it in the layman's terms, but they're adding what they call a penis that's no bigger than the tip of this pen. And I, I, I wonder what the ramifications are to somebody who they've convinced that that's okay when, when they get older and figure out that, wow, that doesn't, that doesn't look normal. Doctor, go ahead and answer those questions. Chairman, thank you. Um, so to speak uh, for the, to the first point, um, when I, when I, mentioned reversible cause, reversible procedures. I'm discussing hormone therapy primarily that is uh, based on blocking the progression of sexual maturation, so which is reversible. And what I had said is that no one here in the state of Wyoming is doing the types of procedures that you graphically uh, explained for us all. Um, and frankly, the 
you know, if there are, those kind of things are being done, we as an academy of pediatrics would also oppose that. However, to blanket, uh, restrict, and criminalize the processes that take a long time to work through, yes, we're treating depression ahead of time, and yes, we're trying to deal with the anxieties and everything else that comes along with this very difficult and very complicated situation, as was mentioned by um, uh, a speaker before me. This is not simple, and yes, we try whatever we can do in the most, in the least um, harmful and lasting way. So we are definitely going to be doing, um, you know, the we we always abide by the rule of do no harm, um, and but I don't think we can ignore the the statistics that children with gender dysphoria have such a higher rate of all these things, depression, anxiety, homelessness, suicide, um, that it would be irresponsible to not um, fully uh, be able to use our, you know, our entire toolbox at the beginning, at the outset. And I'm not saying we need to do this in any kind of yeah, general manipulation or mutilation, as was mentioned. But it, we don't need to criminalize and make it so that people like myself don't want to practice here. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, sir. I had go ahead, Senator Hutchings, quickly, please. I'll try, uh, Doctor. Do you have statistics on those people that have been transitioned? Uh, their rate of suicide. Go ahead, Doctor. I don't have those exact statistics, no. Thank you. Quick follow-up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, ma'am. Uh, sir, you talked about reversal of the hormone therapy. What happens to the body? Let's just say you started the hormone therapy at 12. Now I'm 20. I don't want to be, um, I don't want to go through the therapy anymore. You stop the therapy. What happens to the body? Go ahead, doctor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. So, you know, it depends on what we're talking about. Hormone therapy is is a pretty broad um, topic, but if you're talking about just uh, puberty suppression, I don't think there's many that would continue puberty suppression for that long, just because of because of what we know about, um, yeah, potentials with uh, bone mineralization, et cetera. But um, you know. Some, and I, and I will say that some types of hormone therapy, like if you're talking about estrogen therapy and testosterone therapy, though, those are, though, though, I wouldn't say those are completely reversible. I'm really, when I mention what is happening in our state, potentially at, at the current moment, we're talking about there is, there are, there are some hormones that are meant to stop the progression of puberty, and those are the ones that might be used just to allow these children and teenagers a little more time to go through social transition and, and to make sure that this is the right decision for them. It's not, a, they're, we're not doing estrogen testosterone therapies like that. So, um, and, and to, to answer your final question, if, if those hormones are given, there could be, you know, there's, there are some risks with those therapies too. Um, but we, we have been using sex hormone um, or puberty suppression, I should say, those those types of medicines for precocious pu puberty or early puberty for, you know, decades. Um, and, and they work in younger children without long side effects. But I will say we haven't been using them probably for long enough to know any really long, long, long term effects. Like one super quick. Let's 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 move on to the next testimony first because we're we're this running out of time. This could be for both. This well, let's get her testimony okay. first, and then we'll decide. Go ahead, uh, Chairman Baldwin, committee members. Um, my name is Jennifer Muma, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker here. Uh, I practice mental health in a private practice here in Cheyenne. I've received advanced training in gender affirming care for all people, including transgender and gender expansive individuals. Um, and I've been providing these services throughout Wyoming, um, not just in Cheyenne, for over 11 years. 
I'm well versed in the standards of care, which have not been mentioned yet is the governing body of what physicians, mental health providers, um, doctors, any kind of provider of medical services are generally followed in our country as guidelines for practice in terms of transgender care. Um, this is published by the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, um, also known as WPATH. Uh, and I am also a, a full member of WPATH. So my testimony today is in opposition of this bill. Um, the reasons for this are that gender affirming care is a medically necessary care that can be life saving, life -saving for transgender youth. Medical, medical necessity and medical decisions, I believe, strongly believe that belong between trans youth, their parents, guardians, and mental, excuse me, medical providers. Um, the standards of care also includes the mental health provider's role in that as well, as well as, as a form of ensuring that this whole process is uh, comprehensive. It's, it's something that's including the medical, or excuse me, the mental health component um, in regards to gender dysphoria. Um, I do, there has been research that this bill will crim criminalizing gender affirmative care with minors can negatively impact their mental health to include uh, depression, anxiety, risk for suicide. Um, I know that there's been some concern around detransitioning. We've kind of thrown around that, that idea around growing out of their gender, or excuse me, their transgender identity. And from the research that I've done, um, it, the, the outcomes of that have been generally overemphasized and the research doesn't seem to offer sound reasons to oppose or delay gender affirming care, including any kind of pre-pubertal society or you know, transitioning of with medications. Um, I think what I would ask is to trust the process. This, these organizations, um, my organization, the National Association for Social Workers, WPATH, the Standards of Care, many of these others, um, have created a very detail research evidence based process to ensure that these services or surgeries or hormones are not just being accessed because somebody's being preyed on or so that because somebody it's a fad this is a very this is taken very seriously by my profession amongst others um, and so that i ask that you you trust the process that's been laid out um, on a personal note and, and my final note as a mental health provider i've experienced firsthand the negative impacts that bills such as such as these have had on trans minors throughout Wyoming. Um, aside from my experience as a therapist, I've also worked in the ER. Um, I've seen again firsthand from that perspective the devastation that non-affirming care and actions against trans youth have had. And I can say that my experience has matched that of the research that's um, been provided. I know I, I sent out some documents with additional reference and research. Um, and the outcomes are not good. 15 seconds. Uh, thank you for your time, consideration, and service to Wyoming. I stand for questions. Senator Hudson, did you have a question? I, I did, but I'm going to hold off. Thank okay. You. So, committee, we're going to have a choice here before we get to your representative. We're going to have a choice. I've got a dozen people sitting online, probably more sitting here in the audience. We can continue this bill. We can close public testimony and take a vote. It, it's at the committee's pleasure what you would like to do, Senator Barlow. So Mr. Chairman, I think we take the one person at the desk and then we try to get as much, many as we can offline. If, because those folks have been, you know, stopped their days. Anyway, where, where do you think, Mr. Chairman? Senator Doctor. It certainly has to be Mr. continued. Mr. Chairman, how many in the room did they come to testify? How many in the room are here to testify? How many have something different to say? Okay, uh, out of all those who have their hands raised, how many are here in support of the bill? Raise hands. How many are here in opposition to the bill? Okay. So committee, further comments? Uh, obviously, we're not gonna make it through all that oh, testimony just, today. Just, Mr. Chairman, I just yes, hesitate sir. to, if people come to testify that, and we don't have time, then we delay Agreed. it. Point, a scalpel. point well taken. Thank you. What, what I'm concerned about is people that have traveled here from today, Cheyenne. if they traveled. Um, so how many have traveled who are not here from Cheyenne, I guess would be my question. Yep. Come up here up front, please. We'll, we'll take a testimony to those who have traveled from out of town. Mr. Chair, yes, ma'am. I suspect that 90% will say yes. So, yeah. 
So if all those folks from out of town who have traveled here today to testify, if you want to come up and please come to the chairs. Seeing none. See none. Let's go ahead and take testimony of representative. We'll take testimony of you too, and then we'll decide what to do. So go ahead, representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the of the body. Um, I just want to address a couple things that I've heard here this morning. First of all, I do believe that this is a fad. If we look historically at how long this has been uh, an issue that has has become centrally focused in our society, and I believe politicized. It is recent, and we see a large number, uh, an exponential increase in the number of people that are being affected by this, what I'm going to call a fad. So if that's the case, I have concerns about our counseling associations and our counselors that are promoting a dysphoria uh, or a treatment of a dysphoria that is very different from every other type of dysphoria that they treat. If we have anorexia, for instance, we don't treat that by affirming and then having surgery or some other invasive um, action to mitigate that. We adjust or we treat the mental illness that has led to that, depression, whatever may have come from that or caused that. So I have concerns that in the long run, if we continue to treat this way, uh, and people continue to come of age and then find out that they really don't want this. They've already trusted in their parents when they were youth, who were advised by these um, counselors that this was the only type of treatment. And now the very people, their parents and the counselors that might help them reverse this situation, they're not going to be able to trust them because that's who led them into the situation. So I'm very concerned about how we're treating this particular dysphoria, especially amongst children. I believe that's what the bill addresses is children. And along those lines, I just want to say that we as a legislature do have a responsibility to be involved in these things because we do have a responsibility to protect those who are, are of a minority or who don't have a voice. And in this case, we're talking about children who definitely don't have a voice in the legislature. So with that, I, I am on and for the bill and appreciate your time. Thank you, Representative. Ladies, go ahead, ma'am. Whichever ma'am wants to jump in there. If you can keep it down to two or three minutes, appreciate it. Very sorry. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman Baldwin, for this opportunity. Like I said before, I'm Rebecca Franklin. I am an OBGUN in Sheridan, Wyoming, and I've been there for 10 years. Um, I do hold a scalpel a lot. And it's one of my favorite things in the whole entire world to do. Um, I really, as awful as that sounds, enjoy blood loss at a very alarming rate. Um, and so I have chosen the profession in which blood loss is very common. Um, and I'm not trying to make light of the situation, but surgery is an incredibly um, thoughtful process that takes an incredible amount of time and skill to learn how to do. Um, and it also takes an incredibly thoughtful process to decide to do surgery. Um, the best surgery that I can do is actually to not to do surgery. And so um, I try very hard to counsel all of my patients um, about all the risks and the benefits of any surgery they're potentially going to undertake. Um, as far as gender affirming surgery, there is currently no gender affirming surgery happening in the state of Wyoming. Um, and it is definitely not happening on children. Um, this um, bill was thoughtful enough to include a lot of exemptions um, for very, um, very rare medical conditions. And yes, those surgeries do sometimes occur here in this state, but many times they're traveling out of state to have those surgeries. Um, in adults, to have gender affirming surgery, um, most of those patients are spending um, at least a year on hormones before any surgery could even potentially be accomplished. Um, and I just, I wanna leave time for lots of questions um, about surgery, um, specifically in these children, um, because I'm not a pediatric surgeon. I'm gonna try and leave it to my expertise to answer those questions. Um, but I think it's really important to understand that 
criminalizing physicians, criminalizing surgeons, especially because there's very few of us in the state, um, sets a really terrible precedent. Um, and please don't do that. Thank you. Questions, committee? Go ahead, Senator Hutchins. Push your button, ma'am. Mr. Chair, ma'am, did I hear you right when you said you love blood loss? I know it sounds terrible, but someone has to like to do surgery. Somebody has to like to make that blood loss stop, right? Somebody has to like to do what I do. It seems very strange, but someone has to like to do pap smears. Someone has to like to do kind of the dirty work of making sure that people get taken care of. There's a follow up, Mr. Mr. Um, Chairman. You mentioned the scalpel, very important. The scalpel can cut something off. It does. If we remove breasts, if we remove penises at the age of four, five, six, seven, up to 18, what can bring those back when they, after 18, decide, oops, I didn't want that done? I was watching a documentary where a young man was mentioning that he was in surgery and he remembers screaming in his mind because he couldn't do it with his mouth. No, no. His penis was cut off and there was nothing they could do to put it back on. So help me understand, because that's what this bill is talking about, mutilating children. How do we put those things back? How do we put them back together, Humpty Dumpty, once um, they've taken the fall? Doctor, go ahead. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hutchings. Um, again, um, this is not happening in the state of Wyoming. Um, and the most common childhood genital mutilation that happens in the state of Wyoming is actually circumcision. And it's done within 24 hours of, of life. And um, that, unfortunately, is an incredibly common process. And there's probably many of those victims sitting in this room today. Um, and I don't know um, about the reconstruction of a penis, um, as I am not a reconstructive plastic surgeon, which is usually a highly specialized topic. But I do know um, that some of my patients actually do undergo these surgeries, um, not for gender affirming care, but for medical conditions. They're very involved surgeries that take months, if not years, and they're done in stages. Um, and obviously, what comes with those stages is lots of counseling. Um, lots of consults with surgeons, um, lots of trips and expenses for many medical conditions that require those um, surgeries to be done. I hope that answers your question. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. Are you aware of the Reimer twin experiment? And that's the end of my questions. Thank you. Um, I apologize. Um, I know of the experiment. I don't know the details. Again, in um, my field, um, this is not something that's normally handled by a general gynecologist. It's usually by several subspecialists. Okay, thank you. Let's take final final comments, and then we're going to move on. Go Hi, ahead. I'm Dr. April Kranz. Um, I've been a pediatrician for 14 years, and I work at the Cheyenne Regional Medical Center. Um, I th I oppose this bill very strongly, and. Um, I think that this room is full of people who care deeply for the well-being of children, and um, many many of us have dedicated our lives to the health and well-being of children. And if this bill goes through, children will be harmed. Um, it's clear in listening to the testimony of of the many different people so far today that there is a lot of conflicting information about out there about you know what is the best way to to treat these children. Um, has anyone ever been harmed by this kind of treatment? And um, I think that it will be important going forward um, to have more research and to, to learn more about the best ways to care for these patients. Um, I, I would really hope that as people who all care about the, the well-being of children, that we invest ourselves in, in learning more about how to care best for these children and not to criminalize that um, that care, um, criminalizing criminalizing the provision of, of um, gender affirming care will put a stop to that, and it will discourage any further um, discussion or investigation into the best way to to um, to 
care for these children, and I think that would be a disaster. Um, I do want to, it sounds like there's also been a lot of misunderstanding about the, the surgical aspect of gender affirming care as opposed to the medical aspect. And um, I'm most concerned about not criminalizing the medical aspects of, of this. Um, and I think we've heard from, from several um, folks already that, that these surgeries are, we don't, we're not supporting doing this surgery on children, um, and that is not the standard of care um, to, to, to do surgery on, on these children. So I don't think that that's an important aspect of um, the consideration of this bill, which actually says is, is talking about criminalizing all medical aspects of, of uh, transgender care. Um, I also want to uh, want to plead with you to pay more attention to the testimony that that you've heard today that's given by individuals who have personal experience with these patients with their families um, and professional experience with them as opposed to these um, to many well meaning citizens that have strong opinions about this, but do not have professional or personal experience in this area. Um, and another thing I would mention is that really um, refusing to provide the standard of care for these patients with um, gender dysphoria syndrome is really tantamount to requiring medical neglect of these patients. Um, there are well established and well accepted standard diagnostic criteria for gender dysphoria syndrome that have been in use for for um, a lot of time. And um, I just, I, I encourage you to, to not criminalize the science behind this. 15 um, seconds, go ahead and wrap up if you would. Mm -hmm. So that's all, I, I, I think it's complicated. I don't have all the answers. I'm not an expert in, in this area, but I, I am a physician, I'm a, I'm a scientist healer and I don't think that criminalizing uh, this and passing this bill is going to, to do good for children. Thank you very much. Committee, I think we're gonna close public testimony. I know there's a lot of people online, et cetera, that wanna testify. I would encourage you to send us emails or send emails to the body of the Senate uh, with thoughts, but I think we need to close and I think we need to move on. We're gonna be a little bit late as it is, but I don't care. Don't tell the president I said that, please. So let's just go down the road here and let's just give some thoughts on the bill before we actually. No, Senator Scott, if you'd like to come up to the chair. No? Are you sure? Okay. Okay, thank you very much. And that, Aaron, public testimony is closed. Committee, what's your pleasure? Move the bill. Move the bill. We'll give that one to Senator Hutchings. Senator Hutchings, would you like to give your thoughts? Yes, Mr. Chairman. As I listen to what people said, I we got a lot of, um, I guess, ambiguity. It's like, we don't know. We don't know. We don't know. This is this bill will harm the child instead of helping them. And I see it differently. So those are my quick comments. Okay. Senator Bartle. Mr. Chairman, so since there is no definition in the bill of change of the sex, to me, sex is a chromosomal issue. And I don't know that anybody's doing chromosomal therapy. So I would argue that this may do nothing since we are not actually identifying what change the sex is. Um, and, and that actually came from a physician in, our, in, in another community who said, look, um, mutilation is on the books. Female mutilization is on the books. Um, there are other things. Yes, there are hormone therapies, but change the sex um, is not being is not being identified, and that is a chromosomal thing. What we appear is something else. That's a manifestation of chromosomes. It is not um, saying so. I I don't know that this bill gets to what the bring would actually say because it's going to be having interpreted as what has changed the sex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Doxer. Thank you. Appreciate Senator Barlow's note on this. Um, I probably have nothing further. I probably have no nothing further to say, but I'll be with the bill. Senator Bashar. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I mean, we, we heard things about, I think, WPATH, uh, I mean, that's the right organization. I've done a lot of reading on that subject. Uh, some of the opposition that has talked to these organizations has said there's no new data. It hasn't, there hasn't been a change since 2015. There's actually hospitals that are actually pulling back and changing their procedures uh, to not do the things they were talking about in this bill. So I think that may be the direction that we need to head in as well. We need to put the brakes on and start looking at data. Thank you. And I get the final word. Uh, my final word is this, is I will be a no on the bill. I think, and this is my view only, of course, is I think the bill is vague. I think it doesn't give specific enough definitions. And, and, and I say that in a number of things. I think, don't think this is a black and white issue. I think this is a very gray issue. Um, and and as, a, as a medical provider, I'm always uncomfortable with a legislature with very little medical expertise. And I'm certainly not an expert, don't get me wrong. But, I, you know, we take these things, we've been here three weeks now, and to take these things and become experts and create law, that, that makes me nervous. It makes me nervous not only in this, but more so in these life and death things. Um, for that reason, I will probably be a no. I don't, I don't know that we have the expertise. I don't know that this bill is refined enough to do what it intends to do. And I think that oh, we've stepped too far into the medical field. Um, and I think we need to let doctors be doctors and not criminalize people. And, and that would be my final comment. And with that, I think we're ready for the vote. Let's go ahead and take roll call, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senate file 111, child abuse, change of sex. Senator Barlow. No. Senator Bouchard. Aye. Senator Dockstatter. Aye. Senator Hutchings. Aye. Chairman Baldwin. No. We have three ayes and two noes. Senate file 111 has passed the Labor and Health Committee in the Senate. Senator Scott, it's all yours on the floor, sir. Okay. Thank you, everyone that came, and I apologize. But all those who weren't able to testify, please email us, give us your thoughts, and we'll see. You. <laughs> and the bill that we didn't hear today will be continued to an indefinite day. I'll decide that. Indefinite? Thank you.